Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hello, welcome to uh, the Heaven Series with Randy Kay, and I have a special guest with me today, Ivan Tuttle. He wrote an amazing bestseller called The Journey to Hell, Heaven, and Back. And if that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what will. So we'll be talking with uh, Ivan here. And uh, Ivan, welcome to, uh, to our series on uh, Heaven and uh, the Afterlife. Well, thank you. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. I'm looking uh, forward to this. Our pleasure, our pleasure. You know, it's um, we've had a number of interviews with uh, people who have experienced uh, the gate of heaven or heaven itself, uh, traveling with angels and so forth. But I think your story is very unique in that you had the experience initially with hell, and then uh, you had the experience in heaven. So, um, and another uh, unique aspect of this, Ivan, is, uh, as we shared earlier, is that what you succumb to, blood clots, uh, is the identical uh, malady ailment that I uh, succumbed to when I had my own afterlife experience. So I know there's a, a great amount to, to your story and lead up to what happened, but I'll let you start wherever you would like in telling us uh, <laughs> about your <laughs> incredible experience. Well, I, I guess I guess to start out with is that, you know, hey, I, when I was a kid, I was a great Christian kid, went to Bible college and then slipped away from Bible college and just messed up my whole life. And uh, when I did that, that's when I ended up with a blood clot. And it, it was a deep, uh, a, I think they called it a DVT today. And, uh, but back then they called it thrombophlebitis, which was a name that was very strange to a 26 year old kid. You know, I, I, I had no idea what they were talking about in my leg, you know? And uh, so I, I spent time in a hospital back when I did this. Um, they put you in a hospital for like as long as they need to, to get your blood thinned out. And then they think you're comfortable and they send you home. So I went home that night. And of course, the first thing I did was do some drugs and do a little bit of drinking and then lay down. If you know anything about my lifestyle back then, I didn't go to sleep before three o'clock in the morning. And here it was nine o'clock at night and I had to go to bed. And it was like, one of these instant things is like, hey, no, I got to go to bed. So I just walked in my room, curled up in a ball, fell asleep in my bed. Now, I don't know if you, you probably don't remember this. I don't know if you're old enough or not. Remember the free flotation water beds? Yes, I do. <laughs> that, okay, well, that's what I had. You know? <laughs> this is 1978. So, and, and I curled up on my left-hand side because I had something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's the heart muscles get thick and they get hardened. And uh, it's a disease that, you know, it's hereditary. Uh, everybody in my family has it. My dad had it. He died at 56. Well, the sister died at 56 from it. Uh, it's a terrible disease. But anyways, when I, 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 you always lay on your left side because when you do that, it helps the blood flow. So anyways, that's what I did. But evidently it helped the blood flow a little too much because what pieces of the clot that were in my leg, a piece broke off. They're thinking it lodged in my heart, not my lungs. They think it somehow bypassed the lungs, went to the heart. They're not sure because I died instantly mm. in my sleep, in my own place. And, mm. and uh, while I was sleeping, I died. I mean, it's like I laid down to go to sleep. I felt real funny. I felt this sharp, it's like a little bit of a sharp pain, but I thought, okay, that must, I don't know. And I, I was out, you know. And I don't sleep like that normally, but I went out. And I guess what happened is I was dying. And then I had something come by and grab a hold of my left wrist and yank me up out of the bed. Now, that, that was absolutely mind-blowing. You know, I was, back then, I was in really, really good shape, very, very fit. And, uh, and so I immediately took into trying to hit this thing, and it had no effect on it whatsoever. And I'm looking and I'm just hitting it real fast. Now, this is only a couple of like a second or two. This is going on. And I'm thinking, OK, this has got to be a nightmare. Nothing this big and ugly can grab a hold of me and yank me up out of my bed. So I thought if I could just turn the light switch on. So I reached over to do that. My hand went through the wall and I'm like, uh oh, 
And I turn around and I look and I'm still in the bed. My body's still in the bed. This thing had me, had my spirit. And it was taking me to hell. I knew it instantly. You just, here's what happened. This is what I learned is that when you die, you instantly know things you could never know in the flesh. You just can't. But I knew instantly where I was going. I knew I was going to hell. I could, I started hearing screaming. I started hearing noises and we just started moving real fast. I mean, I, I can't explain the speed of which we were going. And I saw people, I could hear people screaming. I could feel this intense, intense heat, it was very intense. And, and it was just, uh, it was horrible. The stench, the, I mean, you can smell it. You see, people think that it's only our, you know, our earthly nose that can smell. No, I'm telling you. It, you're smelling it, you're, you're tasting it, everything. And, and I'm hearing this and I'm seeing now it's dark, but you can see in the spirit, you can see through the darkness. It doesn't mean anything to you. And I see these people that have been there, some of them for thousands of years, some people just arrived and they're in hell. And I knew where they were. And I knew that all these people being locked in their place. And when I mean locked, it's like there's something around them, but there's nothing there. I, I, it's too hard to explain. And it's like their feet are just dangling and their arms can move around, but they can't go anywhere. Mm. And they're stuck and they're being tortured. They're being tortured by demons, by all these demonic spirits and things that are there that are actually torturing the people. And they were trying to torture me as well. They were doing things to me. And as they were doing this to me, here's the thing. That I, I got to tell you, this is the toughest part about this, Randy, is that the hopelessness, that when you realize that you're in hell, and you realize it's too late. There's no hope. See, that was the thing I think that got me the worst is that I kept thinking, hey, I was not that. But yeah, so I sold some drugs. You know, I never killed anybody, you know, never deliberately hurt anybody. I mean, I may have hurt people, but not on purpose. You know, why was I going to hell? You know, I couldn't understand that. And yet here I am. And this demon is just laughing at me. This demon thinks I am just the biggest idiot in the world because I gave up on God. And I decided to go the opposite way. And he just thought that was great. You know, what a fool I had been. And he had me and he was taking me. And I knew he was taking me to my final place. And here's what you don't understand. When you go to hell, you're not down there partying with people. You're not having fun with people. You go and that's where you stay. And that's it. And you're not going anyplace. You're not walking around. You're not talking to your buddies. You're being tortured and you can't sleep. There's no thing. Your spirit never sleeps anyways, even on earth right now. Our spirits never sleep. Our body sleeps, our flesh does, but our spirit doesn't. Your spirit doesn't sleep. And in, in the flesh, if you suffer too much pain, you can pass out. In the spirit, you can't pass out. You just keep having more pain. And the pain is intense. Like if you get a splinter, you know how a splinter feels in the finger? It really hurts. Mm -hmm. Well, in heaven, if you get a splint or, or in hell, when you get a splinter in your finger, it's through your whole body. You know, you can feel that same pain through your whole body. So it's intensified. It's much worse. And I'm watching this and I'm looking at these people. And when you look at the people, Randy, every time you saw somebody and you looked at them, you knew every detail about their life, everything about them. Mm -hmm. You knew when they were born, how they were born, what happened. You, it's just instant, you know, instantly everything. And I know why they're in hell. You know, and when you see this and you see young people in hell, because they didn't want to believe in God. They didn't want to believe in Jesus. You know, they didn't want to believe in those things that they thought, you know, just like I was thinking at that time, you know, all I could think of is that, Hey, I want to do stuff to satisfy myself. It wasn't to satisfy the Lord. It was to satisfy me. And that's what happens in life. And, and I was being tortured so bad. I, I it's hard for me to describe it because when I do, it's very emotional. I, I wish I could just forget that part of it. You know, mm. but it's a very important part. Does that make sense to you? It does. And something also I think that it impressed me in hearing about your story is that uh, you saw people you knew. Yes. In hell. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, there were people that I knew that uh, had been older than me. They had died and they went to hell. I've seen some of those. I talked about a neighbor that I'd seen. Um, I'd seen a relative that was in hell. I won't describe who that person is because there's still some of his family still alive. So I won't discuss who it was, but I saw that. Um, I saw preachers in hell. I saw evangelists in hell. So preachers um, and evangelists. Yeah. 
did you have an impression as to uh, why? I know there's the, um, the parable of the sheep and the goats, uh, and that's oftentimes a, a fear that, uh, you know, the, because the, the, the goats were saying, essentially, well, I served you, Lord, and, and now I'm, you know, they find themselves in this pit. Um, were they um, just wayward preachers? Did you have any inclination as to why they were there? Yes. Greed is the number one reason why most of them mm -hmm. were there. They became very greedy. They were robbing from God. I'm just going to be blunt. There's nothing wrong with somebody doing something and making a good living. I have nothing about that. But when you rob from God and you twist things around for your benefit instead of for God's benefit, you're wrong. That was the number one reason. The other reason was because of sexual perversions that were hidden. Uh, a lot of people were in there because of that. Um, there were very, uh, some that were very, very abusive people behind closed doors, but nobody knew about it. Uh, you can't, you can't live this lifestyle. You can't, you know, you know, as well as I do that when God has done something like what he's done for you and has done for me to be able to bring us back after having these experiences, we have to, we have to walk a line that other people might not think about, but we have to walk that line because we know what happens if we don't, you know, and, and if you're called to do something, <clears throat> my, my advice is do not look to the left. Don't look to the right. You always keep your eyes focused on him and everything that you do better be for him, not for yourself. And, and I'm very blunt about that. And, and that doesn't make me popular in some circles, but I, I don't care because it's so important to know that if we're going to do the work of the Lord, we have to live a life accordingly. And if we don't live a life accordingly, what happens after you die, you know, you negate everything that you tried to do here on earth. And when you see these people are in hell and they're down there, and these are the people that led so many people to the Lord, but then turned and led them astray and just got them on this path of following them, not following him. Mm. You know, that's, that's so important. And you know, this, you know, that's, that's why we both have a friend, Sid. I love him because he, he puts God first in everything he does. Yeah. What an example for us, you know, you know, fellow people to have too. And it's, it's a good example. And when we start realizing that we are accountable for every single person that's sitting out there when we speak, we're accountable for them. And what are, what are we going to do to make sure that they know that what we're telling is the truth and how do we, how do we bear up to that? In other words, how do we hold up to that so, ourselves? Yeah, that's such an insightful point, I think, Ivan, in that... Um... You know, the Colossians 3.23, whatever we do to do it as unto the Lord, yes. I think is a discipline that you're talking about. Now, one thing that you saw that I thought was fascinating is you actually saw the person of, of Satan, the devil. Yes. Uh, was he, uh, and the, the decrepit nature and look of the kind of the rotting uh, souls, if you will, of those in hell, was that how Satan appeared? As well. No, just the opposite. You see, you have to realize he was one of the most beautiful creatures ever created. And when God created him, when he was sent out of heaven, he was kicked out of heaven. He still has that beauty to him. He doesn't have the glory with him anymore. You know, like you would think, but he's still beautiful. He's probably the, the best. Oh, I don't know how to explain it. If you were to say a person, which he's really not, the best looking person, type, angel looking person you could ever imagine. Uh, brilliant, bright, very attractive. Anybody that looks at him would be drawn to him. You can't help it. Man or woman, you'd just be drawn to this person. That's just the way he is. Mm. And he uses that to his advantage. He's not this pitchfork tail thing with, a, you know, walking around with a horn sticking up that's not him that's maybe that's his demons and some other things but that's not who he is and he's he's a beautiful light but but he's he, he's horrible you know he you have to understand the evil that's inside of that you know yeah so, yeah well that makes sense so we've uh heard the reference of uh satan being the angel of light and uh the deceiver obviously but i think the juxtaposition between 
uh, the demons who are lifeless and uh, their appearance is, is, is ugly to right. one of Satan who is very appealing. And that dichotomy or contrast is, um, is striking to say the least. And I wonder why that is, why you know, Satan would preserve his, his brilliant appearance, whereas those who are in hell were decrepit and lifeless and actually in decay. Yeah, I wish I had the answer for you on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, we've heard that that uh, before, you know, the decaying, the rotting, there's no life, there's no sense of purpose, there's nothing that is redeemable uh, in in hell itself. So you are there, Ivan, and I know that there was a period of time in which you were in, after being in this horrendous place in hell, that you actually had a visitation in heaven. And you were, uh, I think, uh, clinically dead for about three hours, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. Uh, so what, how did that transition happen from well, sure. hell to heaven? Well, this is what happened, is as this demon was taken to put me in my final place in hell, because you have a place you're going to stay, I, 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 I'm, I'm just like, I'm dead, you know, I mean, in, spiritually you're dead because there's no hope there's no anything even though the people cry out to you when you're coming to hell everybody comes to hell they get everybody cries out to them help me help me help me because they don't know what's going on they just know these people are coming and they're going to be put in a place and but there maybe there's some way that can help them all of a sudden as i'm being put in this place being tortured by this big demon and other demons but this big one that had me a voice rang out and the voice says you must let him go it's not his time I made a promise to his mother. When that was said, this demon shook, was petrified of that voice. Let go of me. This demon that I've been beating and trying to hit couldn't do anything to let go of me. And instantly, I mean, like, boom, man, I, I, I just I felt myself move. And then the next thing you know, I'm at the gates of hell. Hmm. So this is, that's interesting. You, is, was it the angel then that had heard the prayers of your mother? No, it was God. It was God, God, who God heard those prayers and spoke that to, to the demons. So the demons yes. were uh, needed to heed God's word. They, yes. even though they were apart from God, God still uh, could essentially order them uh, to yes. return you. And they had to obey. They had to. And as soon as they let go of me, I just, I, my whole body just took off. And I went right to the gates of him. Now I'm greeted by this big angel. And, and this angel probably had to be, well, there, there's no measuring stick up there. So I'm, I'm going to say he looked like about seven foot tall, just a rough guess. Uh, he could have been 20 foot tall. I don't know. Because in, in heaven, things are a little bit different than they are on earth. So, and, and I was greeted by this great big angel, you know. So, and, and when he spoke even, you could hear the power, the soothing and the power. Now, in hell, as horrible as it was and as hopeless as it was, outside the gates of heaven, getting ready to go into heaven, all of a sudden, this euphoric feeling comes all over you. And it's, just, it's like, oh, wow. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you're home. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. But it's like, <laughs> ah, this is where I'm supposed to be, you know. And it's better, I, trust me, I did a lot of drugs. It's better than any kind of drug you could ever imagine. You know? It was just like, ah, you know, every part of you is singing. You know, your, your, your fingers are singing almost. You know, it's just how you feel because it's like, ah, elation, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, what's, what's interesting about that, Ivan, it's, is the intercession of your mother praying for you that God heard those prayers and and even though at that point it doesn't sound like when you were in hell that you were uh, repentant, you were just lamenting the fact that you were there in this terrible place. Right. But it was the prayers of your mother that mm-hmm. God had heard, and on her behalf had saved you from hell. Well, here's here's the kicker to it. My mother, from the day I was born, prayed for me anywhere from two to three to four times a day. Just figuring out a couple times a day that she prayed for me. By the time I was 26, 26 and a half, she prayed for me over 22,000 times. Mm. Do you think God's not going to listen after 22,000 <laughs> times? 
You know, he's going to hear that, you know. So after 22,000 times of my mother praying, you know, God answers this prayer because my mother used to always say, none of my children, she'd say, none of my children will ever go to hell because I've raised you right. I've done the right thing. And I've made God promise me that you, you, all of you will give your lives to the Lord and stay with the Lord. Even though she knew at that time in my life, I had actually, I mean, I was so far from God. It, it was ridiculous. You know, I mean, I, I knew there was a God, but yeah, you know, it was all about me then. You know, <laughs> that's just the way life was. And my mother's prayers touched him. You know, it, it, it caused me to be released from hell. And then I was able to go into heaven. Mm. Now, and this angel took me by the hand, reached out his hand, explained to me I have to hold his hand, and that I'm not ready to be in heaven by myself. He's going to walk me around. God has something for me. And he wanted to show me around in heaven. And then show me some other things. So the angel took me by the hand, went in through the gates of heaven. And then I started seeing all these things in heaven. You know, all these buildings, all these people, all these different things that were going on in heaven. It was so beautiful, you know. You know, I saw a river running right down the middle of the city, you know. Uh, it, it, it was crystal clear. I mean, you couldn't tell that it was really water because it was so clear, but you could hear it. And where it was going over small little areas, you know, were shallower. It sounded like little babies laughing, you know, that's, that's the way it sounded to me, you know, and uh, it, it was just beautiful. It's the most beautiful, wonderful thing you could ever imagine. I guess you've been there. So. Well, I concur. Certainly I've been, it's, um, I mean, to say it's diametrically opposed to hell would be an understatement. Uh, right. But I, you know, we've had so many people who have uh, contacted us uh, with questions like, uh, you know, my my son, my daughter, my loved one uh, is not a believer, and I pray for them. Uh, and will will they go? Are will they go to hell if they die? Uh, something to that effect. Or um, we've had a number of people who uh, their loved one has committed suicide, and their question is: Is my loved one then condemned to hell? Um, do you have any uh, word on that or answer to, to those concerns? Yes. Actually, I do. Yes. First of all, <clears throat> you never know what somebody's thinking. You never know what somebody's going through. Uh, you might have somebody that's, you know, a loved one that just never gave their life to the Lord. But many times people in the last second of their life, they do. It says anybody calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when they call and they say, Jesus, I recognize you as the son of God. You know, you are the son of God forgive me my sins, you're gone. Now, you can do that verbally or you can do it mentally because what we think, we do, right? And, 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 and even it talks about in the Bible that if a man thinks about sin, he's committed to sin, right? If he thinks about adultery, he's committed adultery. So the same thing goes that many people, and I, I got to see this up in heaven, there were people in heaven that had committed suicide. Contrary to what Religious people might want to believe <laughs> you know, the, the religious spirit on that. But truthfully, there's many people that have lived seconds later and said, oh, God, forgive me. I did this wrong. Jesus, forgive me. Do you think they're not forgiven? Why mm -hmm. wouldn't they be forgiven? Now, here's another thing I'll say, too. If somebody is not in their right mind, somebody is mentally ill, God is not going to judge that person for their mental illness. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't. And, and, and that's not something our God would do. Yeah, He's not going to judge them. If, if it's a mental illness and they can't differentiate between good and evil and, you know, God and, and, and hell, they're forgiven. I agree. Like children. Yes. You know, it's, uh, there's so many uh, answers to common questions here in this world that are answered in heaven. One of which you write about and have spoken about, which is, uh, the unborn or those, uh, you know, like you've talked about who have taken their own lives or they've died too soon. But tell us about that, because that's another kind of theological question that people have is uh, what happens to those who have been, uh, you know, taken, aborted or uh, that, you know, they lost their life in infancy or some, what, what happens to them? Well, first of all, for all the mothers out there and fathers that, you know, have 
experienced the abort. Well, as far as the father being a part of the the wife the, or the woman that had the abortion, let me tell you something. Every aborted child is in heaven waiting. Every single one that's ever been aborted, no matter what phase that it was in, is in heaven. Not in that phase, but it's in a baby baby phase or baby stage, whatever God has deemed for that at the time for the mother or the father to come and see the child so that they can experience something. Every single one of them are there. And, and here's the unique thing. Now, I get excited about this. But when, the, when I saw, I saw mothers coming into heaven, you know, and when they came into heaven, their little babies came to greet them that had been aborted or had been stillborn, or had been a, a miscarriage or whatever. They came to greet their moms, you know, run, and the mother knew who they were and the children mm -hmm. knew who their mother were. And they run and they greet them and they meet them and they hug them. And it's like one of the most wonderful, beautiful things that could ever happen. And, mm -hmm. and it's it's just beautiful. And it's uh, it, there's nothing like it. You know, there's nothing like it. And, and, and you know, babies that, that, that have been miscarries and stuff, the mothers and fathers, well, mothers and fathers on both sides of the abortions, too. They greet the fathers, too, you know. And because when we're in heaven, we're a lot different than we are on earth, you know, <laughs> and it's uh, uh, men become a lot softer up there. Okay. <laughs> so we need to, we need to practice that more here. So, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like, ah, oh. but when you're greeted by that, it's like, wow, it's just the most wonderful, beautiful feeling and thing that can happen, you know, and, and you see this and it's exciting to watch all these babies, you know, and, and they run to their, their moms and their dads, you know, and, and they get united, you know, it's beautiful. Oh, so. you know, and that will speak to so many uh, mothers and fathers for that matter, who uh, may be lamenting uh, yeah. the loss of, of their uh, infant or their child or their unborn. Um, something I, that fascinated me about your story, Ivan, was that you were shown creation in heaven. So God revealed to you the formation of the earth and this, this world. Tell us yeah. about that. Wow, that's, that's uh, probably one of the parts that have affected me the most in, in some respects is when I got to see, all right, so you can read in the Bible exactly what I saw, but I saw it in a, in a way that I don't think we realize it, how important what it's saying in the word of God, when you read Genesis chapter one, one, two, three, four, and you start reading it. When God made this earth and it's, it's just a ball of water, just kind of like moving around like a ball of water would. And you know, almost like a bubble, but not it's water. And it's just sitting there. It doesn't really have any real basic form. And all of a sudden, and it says so, the spirit of God, the spirit of God, not the Holy Spirit, and there's a difference, God himself, God is spirit. Jesus says it in John. God is spirit. Worship him, spirit and truth. God is spirit. So his spirit came down and it moved across the waters of the deep, moved across the whole earth. Now, why did he do that? What makes our earth so different than any other planet? The water is part of it, but we have the only water that has life in it. And the reason why it has life in it is because God came down there in his glory went into the water and came in and reflected back out of the water. It was going in and out. And where was the first place there was life at on earth? It tells you in the Bible, it was in the water first, then in the air. But it was in the water because God was preparing this earth for man. He made this earth strictly for man, not for the other creatures and the other animals. It was for man because he was going to have a place to come in fellowship with this, these beings that he was creating that he wanted to create this whole planet of these beautiful people that are going to worship him and he could have fellowship with, communion with. He gave us dominion over all these things, but he had to prepare the earth. So his glory was on it. Now, here's something that I want you to think about. When God's glory is on something, it never leaves. Hmm. It doesn't go away. There's no expiration date on God's glory. So all the water that was here at the beginning of the earth is still here today. It hasn't gone anywhere. We still have it. So even the water that we have today that we drink has had the spirit of God over it, touching it, around it, over it. And I, I tell people, if you think about this, 
if you understand the importance of that water. But his spirit is on it. His glory is on that water. And, and just to throw something at you, where do we get most of our inspiration from when we're taking a bath or taking a shower? That's when we get most of our glory inspiration. Why do we use water? Water is to cleanse us. It's to get rid of Why do we baptize in water? There's so much to it. But when we realize it, it happened from the very beginning when the spirit of God came down and hovered over the earth. And then when he separated the land and he did all of these things to it, when he said, let there be light. You know, all these things, I got to watch happen. I watched him as he formed Adam out of the dirt, the dust, whatever you want to call it, of the earth. And I watched him as he formed him, you know, and he made him. And he blew in his nostrils. And when he did, it's just like, and Adam was like, it's like he was alive, but he wasn't alive. In other words, he was breathing, but he didn't have the spirit. And when he breathed into him and the spirit became Adam, it was a completely different being on the inside out, you know, and all of a sudden he has all of this knowledge. We were created not just in his image, but in his likeness, meaning we were given not just the spirit, but the ability to think and do things. And the, I mean, how, where did language come from? It came from that moment when he breathed into the nostrils. Adam knew just about everything he needed to know because he was a part of God. We have God's DNA in us. Every single one of us do, you know? So I watched that creation. I watched how it happened. I watched the animals being formed. I watched all of this. I watched the garden being made, you know? Mm. I watched I watched as he put Adam to sleep and he took the rib out of Adam. You know, it wasn't a big hole out of him. He just reached in, took it and made Eve so Eve could be a part of him, part of his DNA, you know, and did this. So I got to watch all these things. I, I could go into great detail. It could take us forever. But, you know, I'm just giving you an idea. I got to see this happen, you know, and it was beautiful. Mm. You know, Ivan, we've had um, a number of people have told about the vignettes or their life in review when they've uh, been to heaven. But yours was, I think, uh, it was one of a kind and that the Lord was showing you review, not just of your life, but of the creation of earth. And a lot of people struggle with the story of Adam and Eve and, you know, how could God create, you know, in, in six days, um, the universe and those kinds of questions. So, so the Lord was actually giving you a confirmation in, in heaven of these things to testify then in fact, from Genesis to Revelation, that it's all true. It's yes. there. You saw it. Yes. It, it is 100% true. You know, what, whatever's written in the Bible is, is so 100% true. It, it just is. And, and I'll tell you this. If you believe in one little part of the Bible, you got to believe in all of it. And, and it, did it take six days? Yeah, it took six days. But it's not something we can comprehend. Okay, our, our flesh and blood, our minds... Our mind's really a filter compared to what our spirit knows. You know, our spirit knows things that our mind can't even comprehend. And, and that's the reason why we can't comprehend all the things that God did. Unless we learn to allow God to operate in us. And then we can say, okay, God, if you can do this, you can do anything. And so that's why we're supposed to have faith in everything. Because we're supposed, we, we're, we're now just starting to get back to where we're supposed to be at in the world. We're now starting this, this glory that's been coming, that's starting to fall, and we're starting to recognize that we're spirit first. Yeah, we are flesh, we are blood, but our spirit, you know, at the point of conception, our spirit is born, you know, in, inside of us. So every single, like we were talking about earlier, a born a child is in heaven, whether it was just two cells or six cells or whatever, it's in heaven. You know, and that's something we have to realize, you know, that that's why abortion is a horrible thing. But when we get back to the earth, we start thinking about the way God did it. And we start realizing what happened, you know, Cain and Abel and those things that happened. All these things happen. There's so much that happened. We can't comprehend it all. We just have to put our faith in him. Mm. So important, you know, the um, especially in this day and age that we find ourselves, uh, Ivan and in uh, a tremendous amount of fear uh, from the COVID virus to, you know, death for a lot of people has become more of a reality. That is, um, you know, they've seen others suffer, they, they've heard stories, what have you. And, 
the Lord is putting in perspective through what you're sharing uh, the, the future of, of heaven, but also the importance of being here in this world. So did God reveal to you why he has us here in the timeline? Because I'm assuming you wanted to stay in that paradise. Uh, unfortunately, I was not ready. See, I was told I had to go back to earth and get straightened out. And I had to, I had to actually go back and ask God to forgive me. In on earth, I had to, it had to be something done in the flesh. So that's what I had to do. I mean, I, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, no, no, I've got to go back and do this. You know, that, that's where you do it at. You don't do it when you're in heaven or when you're in hell. It's too late. You know, it's, it's, whatever you're in hell, it's too late. You know, but you have to go back. So, yeah, I, I was going to be sent back. So. Did he reveal your purpose at that point in heaven? Or is that something well, that was revealed to you later? The, the, there's, there's a greater purpose. I can't discuss all of it because I was told not to until the time which I'm allowed to release some things. You realize I had to wait 35 years before I could ever really do anything. And that's a whole, whole long time. To, I mean, I could tell people I died, went to hell, and came back. But I couldn't tell them what happened. You know, my doctor's got documentation. I died. You know, he believes that I went to hell and he believes I went to heaven. You know, even the doctor agreed that there was something that happened, you know, because it was just not, this doesn't happen. So I basically, my thing is, is that I need to help release the glory. I need to help get people to understand that salvation is the first step that we need to take. But that's the first step. We need to realize that there's so much more than just that. We need to walk in his glory. We need to start doing the things that God wants us to do. We have to start doing things. If, Randy, if we don't start doing things and we don't start operating in the gifts of the spirit, operating in his glory, if we don't start doing that, we're failing him. Mm. We are very important walking in the glory, the presence of God. I know Sid Roth talks about that frequently, and yeah. that's kind of the uh, focus really is on the glory of God. And you had seen the glory of God. Did you see any uh, revelation and while you were in heaven of that glory uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, was there any dynamic there that you can share with us? Well, what, what I can share is this, is that, you know, I got to see the future, not just the past. I also got to see the future. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it looks like there's doom and gloom all over the place. But that's, you have to realize that it's like the Isaiah 60 moment, you know, rise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises, upon, but the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Darkness, great darkness covers the earth, but my glory rises upon you. In other words, we have to realize that in order for his glory to be seen and what we're supposed to be doing today, sometimes you need the contrast of the darkness in order to see the light. And, and that's exactly what's going on today. And when we start realizing that right now, God, God has us here for a reason. He, had, he gave you your experience for a reason. He gave me mine for a reason. Mine is to not just do salvation things. But to understand, people understand that we're all supposed to prophesy. We're all supposed to be operating in the gifts of, you know, the gifts that he gave us. And he gave us all of them are available to anybody that wants them. You just have to say, Lord, I want to do this and go do it. There's going to be people. And I'm telling you, I saw this happening from heaven. There's going to be people that are going to be saved on their own without anybody talking to them, without anybody preaching at them or without anything happening. They're just going to realize, you know, there is a God. Jesus did, you know, they're going to hear something. Something's going to click in their head and they can be sitting at home by themselves or wherever. And they're going to give their life to the Lord. And as soon as they do, they're going to just be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, they'll speak in tongues. They'll do the secret. They're going to go out and they're going to start realizing, hey, I have something now and I want to give it away. And that's where we become selfish as Christians is we have something from God, but we just hang on to it. Mm -hmm. We're not doing anything with it. And what we're supposed to do is all this greatness that God gave us, we're supposed to go out there and lay hands on the sick. We're supposed to help people out of situations, help them recover, help them financially, help them, you know, feed them, whatever the case may be. All of these different things. Now, don't be too consumed. I mean, where you're not doing what you're supposed to do, but we're supposed to understand there's this balance that we need to start realizing we need to do things for the Lord, not just invite somebody to church. That's, that's the old, that doesn't do it. We're supposed to be the church and go out and get the souls saved 
and bring them in so that they can get something to be discipled to go out and do the same thing you do. Mm -hmm. And so if we have all these people out there that are casting out demons like they did in the first century church, if they would cast out demons, they would heal the sick. They would raise the dead. You know, they would get people filled with the spirit, get people saved. If we would do that today, that's what we're supposed to be doing because his glory is being released now in little pockets here and there. And it starts, believe it or not, starting in the United States and it's going over to Israel as well. But it's, it's pockets of glory that's just popping up. But when you get it, we have to stop this, this uh, revival mentality where we have to be revived every year. We need to start saying, okay, I want the glory. I don't want to be revived. I want to stay in his glory. And the only way you can stay in the glory is if you share what he was given. Here's why it dies. Because we get all of this and we're like, oh, this is so good. I had such a blast. This conference was great. Ah, you know, everything was great. And you walk away and you feel good. And, and two weeks later, you're like, boy, I wish there was another one coming, you know, because we didn't give it away. Every time you give it away, God fills you up with more and you give it away and he fills you up with more. That's why I love doing what I do, because I give it away, give it away, give it away. And I get it again and I get it again. And I get I know I'm getting excited here. I can't help it <laughs> because that's my life. You know, that's how I live. But it's it's what I it's what I want, you know, but, and what we should be doing. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Well, you know, it, it speaks to everyone. I think that some feel that you have to be. Um, you have to be either a minister, like a, a priest or, or a king or a queen, whatever, that you're in the priestly realm, which is the ministry, or you're in the other realm. But it really isn't that way, is it? Because no. uh, it's, we're all called uh, to be in ministry and to, to work uh, in, in service to uh, God's beloved. Uh, yes. Let's, uh, Ivan, uh, go to the point at which no, God had, had told you that you needed to go back. Your purpose obviously had not been fulfilled. So you were a, a believer at this point. I mean, who could not? Yes. You've seen the face of God. Um, yeah. So what happened subsequently to that uh, experience and finding yourself back in your body? Well, here's what happened is the paramedics or ambulance drivers, whatever they called them back then, uh, there was a girl at my apartment that night. So like I said, I was backslidden and, and she, she found me dead and she dialed zero, not 911, you know, dialed, okay. Had an old phone in the house, in the apartment. And so she called and they showed up and they came in there and I can remember there was two of them. I was coming back into my body, but it seemed like all of a sudden I just stopped at the top of my room or something. And it was a taller, thinner guy in back and a little bit heavier guy in the front, not big guy or anything, he was a little bit heavier. And he was the one that came up to touch me, you know, to look at me. And he just touched me up under here someplace, you know, and, and you could see, I mean, I was a horrible color. I can't even explain the color that I was, you know, it's like a gray, white, blue, you know, purplish, weird colors. And he just turned around and I remember looking over his shoulder, shaking his head and he, you know, got back up. He didn't have to really bend down far because I had a water bed that was up on the the stand and everything. Two stand, two drawers underneath, and two uh, two levels. So he kind of turns around to the other guy and they walk out. And they were asking a girl about the phone, and she was showing him where the phone was because the radio. I lived in a basement apartment, and his radio wasn't working. So he was going to call the morgue, and they're standing now. This girl's over there screaming like crazy, all right, because I'm dead as a doornail. And I'm laying on my left side. Remember that. So the, the, the guys are looking at each other and they're like, uh, maybe we ought to check and make sure he wasn't shot or stabbed or something. Why don't you go see if he's bleeding, you know? So the one guy goes back in there to check on me. You know, the other guy walked over there too. And as he came in to check to see if I was bleeding and kind of moved me a little bit, I came back in my body. Now I can tell you that it scared him to death, but it scared me to life, so to speak. <laughs> he was like, all of a sudden, I'm like this, and all of a sudden, I'm like, <gasps> you know, and he's like, oh, you know, I'm like looking at him, and, you know, it was really hard to talk. I couldn't really talk. I couldn't really say anything. I had a hard time moving. Um, it was very difficult for a few minutes, you know. Um, the blood was starting to circulate. My temperature was going up. It was freezing cold. 
you know, at that time, because my I've been dead for so long, you know, you're not your normal, you know, 97, 98 degrees, you know, you're down in the 70s or lower 80s or whatever I was at, you know, and trying to warm up your body and you're like shivering and shaking a little bit, you know, but you're trying to get up. And, and I mean, I had blankets and everything, but it's, it's not the same. It's hard to explain. So I'm, I'm coming back to life. And they finally get to the point where I convinced them to get me up. Uh, I wouldn't go to the hospital with them. The first, first word I could say was no. And I kept saying no, 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 no. And uh, I wouldn't let them do it. And they finally got me up and I'm trying to walk, which was really rather funny. Uh, and I'm trying to walk and I'm trying to get them out of my apartment. Now, you got to understand, I had a lot of drugs in my apartment. And the last thing I wanted is I knew if they were there, there's going to police are going to show up pretty soon. And I didn't want them to find the drugs because I was dealing drugs on the side, you know. And so I'm trying to get rid of them. And I finally got her and, you know, the girl out and the, the guys out before the police knock on the door and I wouldn't open the door. But I went through that. But immediately after I got rid of that, I dumped the drugs out. I sat down. I had this little avocado green rocking chair with a little fringe around the bottom of it. And I sat in that rocking chair and I cried my eyes out all night long from midnight to about six o'clock in the morning. I just sat and rocked in that chair, just asking God to forgive me, going over all the things that I had done, how I messed up my life, looking at the things that I really messed up in, how I could have done so many other things. And, and I just sat there and weeped and cried and cried. I cried for that. I cried for the people that were in hell. I cried for the, the knowing that there's going to be people who are still going to hell. I cried because I know that so many things that are going to go on. Now, I didn't cry about anything from heaven. You know, there wasn't anything to cry about in heaven. You know, but I knew that that's where I was going to go. And I knew I was crying, too, because I had to instantly change my lifestyle. I had to change everything about it, which I did. But it, it was it was a process. And then I told you I had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You cannot get rid of it unless you have a heart transplant. Document it. I do not have it anymore. I get tested every now and then because they keep saying, well, when you get older, there's another stage it can happen. But I'm old enough now where they're saying, well, if you don't have it, there's no way you can get it. <laughs> so, but I don't have it. It's completely gone. I have the heart. My heart, not saying something can't happen, but my heart's that of somebody 35 to 40 years of age. Yeah. That's what I was told last June. So well, I can testify to that. I've been in the cardiovascular space. So I've worked a minimally invasive uh, cardiovascular surgery and okay. helping to, uh, to train surgeons and clinical staffs on how to how to perform minimally invasive surgery. So I can testify that that just doesn't, doesn't uh, typically happen or uh, right. in, in, in any case. Um, you well, my, have returned now, you are in the ministry, you yes. um, are ministering and ministered to thousands of people, but there's something that God gave you as, gave you as a gifting in, in uh, I think you, you said seeing through people that is seeing beyond what is the common appearance or how somebody sends out whatever their other their impression is that there's something unique that, that uh the lord gave you yeah i almost hate to tell people sometimes because as soon as i do people start going like this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but god gave me the ability to look into a person i don't know how to explain this i couldn't explain it if i tried I just look at you. I look in your eyes and instantly I can see things about your life. I can see stuff from the time you were born. You know, I, I can't control it. It's not something I can turn off and on. It's just something that's there and it just happens. All of a sudden mm -hmm. I'll look in somebody's eyes and I just know everything about them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and even to the point sometimes where I'm just near you. And I don't even look in your eyes. All of a sudden, I just know something about somebody that might be to my left or to my right or behind me uh, or driving in a car next to me or something like that. And yeah, it's it's rather a unique thing. And it bothered me at first because I didn't understand it and I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it. And it scared me because I knew things about people I never should know. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> You're not supposed to know those things, you know, and but. I've had a lot of talk with the Lord about it. And so I only speak about things that the Lord allows me to speak about, about a person. I might know it, but it makes me understand. I have an understanding of how Jesus, when he met the woman at the well, knew everything about her. 
You know, I have an understanding why Jesus knew what people were going to say before they said it in the crowd. He knew the, he knew the questions before they, before they asked them, you know, and it's kind of a, a unique thing. And I don't know, still not fully comprehensive, uh, comprehending why he gave me this, but I use it. I use it the way he tells me to use it. And that's it. And yeah, mm. it's, it's a unique, it's a unique gift. Uh, it's, I know some people say, oh, you're reading my mail. And I'm like, oh, I'm beyond the mail. <laughs> <laughs> well that I, well, you know i had uh, an experience i won't get into the details that i had in heaven was uh just seeing through my spiritual eyes uh released of my body and all of the encumbrances of my uh stinking thinking as they say and things like that to see into people as they truly are uh, yeah. and as jesus uh, sees them as you as you uh pointed out um that's that's a gifting i you know the gifts of the spirit, which are, you know, throughout the Bible, Corinthians and Peter, first Peter, sure. um, I'm trying to think of what gift that would be, but I guess that's, that's a unique one. That really is um, to really see yeah. to, we've heard, as you said, the, the phrase to, you know, read somebody's mail, but this is actually seeing into the quintessence, the essence of who they are yes, and their life and review and where they came from. So, and I caught that earlier on, Ivan, with, something you said about mental illness, because, uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with that. I've um, struggled with that myself in the past. My daughter has struggled with it. We've had a family history of that. Sure. And th you said that God really um, has mercy, grace yes. for those who are going through, whether it be mental illness, drug addiction, things that have really taken control of their life. And that's something I think um, a number of people need to hear, you know, the grace of God, not the, ex uh, not the excuses, obviously, right. but how do you, how do you differentiate between the grace of God to those who suffer from these physical or mental uh, illnesses uh, and, and those who are making decisions that, that cross the line? I mean, that's, not, not that we're supposed to be judging, uh, you know, that's God's uh, domain, but, you know, that that's something that a lot of people struggle with, I think, you know, they feel like I want to be a good, like Paul said, you know, I want to be the things I want to do. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, I don't do with the things I, I don't want to do. I do. And, you know, that's a common human struggle, isn't it? Yeah, we, we have our own mind. You know, we're, we're not puppets. <clears throat> you know, uh, we do think. We do have a, you know, once sin entered into the world, we all have a carnal mind. and We, we have thoughts that shouldn't be there. Uh, I don't care who you are, you know, things like that happen. And w what we have to understand is that, yeah, we, we're never going to be able to know whether that person is truly mentally ill or not, but God knows, you know, he knows, and he's the one that's going to judge them. He's the one that's going to offer them something that nobody else would be able to offer them. And so we can try to figure things out as much as we want. But again, this goes back to, hey, let's just put our faith in the Lord and try to help people that are like that as much as we can help them. But we also have to understand that God sees them. Just like when God shows me something about somebody, if I see somebody who has a mental illness, I see them differently. When you were asking about what I see, since you mentioned this, I can bring this up. I can see where God's hand is on their life, too, you know, despite the mental illness that they're going through. So I can see God holding them. I know how to explain that, but yeah. it's like, I got this. It's not makes their fault. Sense. Yeah, it makes so. sense, Ivan. We're wrapping things up now, but I just feel that you have um, a prayer and intercessory prayer uh, for those. Um, you know, there, I, I, we receive thousands of communications from people going through horrendous struggles right now. So. Uh, would you pray uh, for our viewing audience uh, and uh, where the Holy Spirit leads you uh, before we sure. close? Sure. If you don't mind. Thank you. Heavenly Thank Father, you. we just come before you, God. I know, Lord, that there's people out here that are listening, that are watching. God, I know there's people out there that are broken. They're so broken inside, God. And that, God, you allow me to just see this as I'm speaking this out, Lord, that they're broken and they're hurting. God, there's people out there that have mental illness problems, God. They don't even want to admit it. They don't even want to address the fact that these are going on. But God, you know them. 
And God, I know your love for them is so strong. And the Heavenly Father, that you have the answers for them that nobody has. And that God, I pray right now that your hand will reach out and you can touch these people, that you can comfort them, that you can make them feel what's going on. And God, even for the people that don't have mental illnesses that are just broken anyways, God, because of the things that are happening on this earth with, with all these viruses and all these other things that are going on, God, I just pray right now that you just you just touch these people. You make yourself real, God. If you have to send angels their way or whatever it is, God, so that these people can start feeling your glory, God. Because Heavenly Father, we know that you don't want anybody to go to hell. I know that. I know that's not the destination. Heaven is the final destination that everybody's goal should be, God. So I pray right now, Heavenly Father, that you break through those barriers. You'll find a way to do it. We're not puppets. We have a free will. But God, I'm praying that you'll help soften us up so that we can make those changes in our lives. And God, I pray that you speak to these people. You speak to them, God, not me, not Randy, but God, your Holy Spirit somehow touches these people and speaks to them, makes them realize what they have to change. And I speak healing into the bodies, healing into the minds healing into their spirit so that God, you can go in there and you can heal them so that they can realize the things that are going on and change their lifestyle and change their life. And we speak that over them, God, in Jesus' holy and precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. That was a, um, you know, life-changing prayer there. I know that many uh, felt that and are going to be making comments. And if you do uh, want to well, I strongly encourage you to get Ivan Tuttle's book, A Journey to Hell, Heaven, and Back. Uh, so we'll note that uh, in the uh, message with a YouTube uh, uh, paragraph there, summation of this episode, and uh, also we'll have it in an audio and what have you. You'll be you'll have that noted as well. So we'll have a reference and a click so you can go and uh, purchase Ivan's book. Uh, you can follow him on uh, your ministry. How can how can people stay in touch with you, Ivan? Well, if you go to, uh, I'm on Facebook mostly, most of the time. So uh, Ivan Tuttle Ministries on Facebook. So yes. you can find me there. That's pretty easy to find me there. I'll, I have some YouTube stuff I'm getting ready to release. Uh, it used to be under Real Heaven Encounters. So if you go to YouTube under Real Heaven Encounters, you can find some things there. Uh, there's I have a, a three-part testimony in there as well. So, and I'm, I also have a web page that we're just launching to just get, get ready to go. It's just ivantuttle.com. So it's good. Well, I, I was looking at your uh, page, obviously. And anyway, but I encourage you to uh, read Ivan's book to, uh, if you have questions or anything that you would like us to relay, certainly you can contact us, um, you know, and, and that will be noted as well. Ivan, it has been a tremendous blessing spending time with you, and thank you so much for sharing, for praying with us, and giving us insights into uh, into God's kingdom and uh, and both he heaven and hell. Uh, this has been truly anointed uh, time together, and thank you so much, Ivan. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. God bless all. Till next time. Bye now. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.